I thank you all for being present here. In this seminar, we have two eminent scientists with us. We have with us Professor Gautam Radhakrishna Desi Raju and Professor Udoy Bandopadhyay. Both of them need no introduction. However, I like to inform our student who are they actually. Desi Raju sir is a professor of solid state and structural chemistry unit of ISC Mangalore. His research contribution particularly notable in the area of crystal engineering and modeling of weak hydrogen bonding. He has published more than 450 scientific articles with citation more than 65,000 and H index is 100, 100 plus you can say. That means 100 articles are cited more than 100 times. Very limited. In India you can see, you can see web page of the scientists of different institutions. We will find it. It will range 25 to 35, 50. But in this case, this is as you H index. This is as you said H index is more than 100. He is now a member of the editorial advisory board of Angukim Chemical Communication and Journal of American Chemical Society. In this pub journals, it is very hard to publish for us. Thus, he is there as the advisory, in the advisory board. He is the former president of the International Union of Krishnagapi. He was awarded Acharya PCI medal of the University of Calcutta in 2015. He received several honorary doctorate degree from international universities. This is a small introduction of this image, sir. Another scientist present here, Professor Udoy Pantubadhyay. In a word, he is the director of Bose Institute of Calcutta. I can say it. Now we are going to start the program by a Vedic invocation by our students. Okay. Beside our principal Moraj, sitting Professor Desaiju sir, and beside Dr. Othingus, Udai Bandhavadhyay is sitting. Now we want to start the program by Vedic invocation by our students.
present over here, uh, respected monastic members of the college family and my beloved students, my respectful namaskar and good wishes in due places. On behalf of the Ramakrishna Mission Residential College family, I extend a most hearty welcome to Professor Desiraju. We feel elated to have him in our midst because he is having such a busy schedule and I am particularly thankful to Professor Dr. Udoy Banerjee for uh, having arranged this uh, gathering, finding some space during his Kolkata tour. Incidentally, this seminar is being organized on the eve of the 75th anniversary of our uh, Independence Day. Azadi Gambit Mahotsav. And also this year marks the 125th anniversary of the foundation of Ramakrishna Mission. So these two uh, events coinciding on the same year and it bears a special significance 
to conduct such a way with another seminar conducted by the IQBC. Why science? That is the topic Professor Desiraj has picked up. And Ramakrishna Mission, right from its inception, or better to say, our tradition itself, uh, as a nation itself, right from the Vedic age, we have been trying to cultivate uh, this rationalistic way of life, a way of thinking. Swami Vedanta, in his famous Reason and Religion lecture delivered at London, mentions is religion to justify itself by the discoveries of reason through which every other science justifies itself are the same methods of investigation which we apply to sciences and knowledge outside to be applied to the science of religion in my opinion this must be so so against this backdrop we are going to conduct this seminar. Definitely science and religion are not contradictory to one another, rather they are complementary. Possibly this is what will be substantiated after this seminar gets over. Once again, on behalf of the residential college family, I extend the most hearty welcome to Professor Desiraj. We are very happy that we have and luminary of his stature in the midst of us today. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Thank you, Mother. Now we we'll felicitate our guest. I request Dr. Devagotu Das, Senior Teachers Council, Come over the stage. Lord Tinsan Maharaj and Dr. Devputa Das will honor this year's shirt with flower bouquet. And in a moment. We will come now for some day, but not day. We have a flower bouquet and a medium dress. Now I request Dr. Rosindranath Ghosh, coordinator of ICAC, to say a few words about this program. Namaskar. At this very outset, on behalf of the Internal Quality Assurance Sir, I welcome you all to this special lecture that is to be delivered by Professor Gautam Deshiraj, who is one of the most cited and active scientists of our country. IQAC, the Internal Quality Assurance Sir, is assigned with the responsibilities of taking different in quality initiatives related programs aimed at the overall quality enrichment of the college. Today's lecture is also aimed at the same objective. This lecture will place science in proper perspective before the students and as I believe this lecture will also set a new benchmark for such quality enhancement related initiatives. 
I want to express my gratitude to Professor Gautam Deshi Raju and Professor Rudai Bandhapadhyay for coming over here. For to Professor Gautam Deshi Raju for particularly being agreed to give a lecture here and for Professor to Professor Bandhapadhyay because for him all this has been possible. Thank you, sir. I like to inform you that uh, Professor Udoy Bandhavadda is the chairman of this program actually, today's program. Now I like Professor Gautam Ramakrishna Desiraju to deliver his talk entitled Why Science? This will, this will do So, Principal Swami A. Chittanand, Dr. Devdatta Das, Dr. Katrin Katrina Das, Professor Uday Kandopadhyay, and uh, everyone in the <coughs> Narendrapur campus. Great pleasure for me to be over here and talk to you. And, uh, you don't have to worry about that stage and all that. That stage is so far away, even Bangalore is closer than that. So, so I told him, I'm going to change my talk after seeing the hall. So that's the first thing about science, you know. You have to learn how to think on your feet. After I saw the hall, I decided to change my talk. And uh, because I want to be a little closer to students and faculty and be part of the community here for about one hour or so. So, so the talk is fairly general about why science and all of you are science students or science teachers. So, <coughs> so what is this business about doing science? Why is it special? And uh, why, why did all of you feel drawn for example to science? You had many subjects to choose from. And somehow or the other you came into this area. Now science is more than just studying some science subjects. It's more than getting an MSc or a PhD or becoming a scientist afterwards. You can have a science degree and um, do something quite different. Just now in the principal's office, I was telling them the example of Margaret Thatcher, who did a MSc in chemistry, structural chemistry in fact. And she was a research chemist in ICI UK before she got into politics. And many of the things she did in her policy matters were the actions of scientific thinking. 
So science is not just doesn't mean I have to do PhD or something like that. Far from it. Science firstly teaches you logic. Science is based on data. It's not based on hypothesis and imagination and all that. That is why we are all different from social scientists. Social scientists they can go on doing so many things. They do also. I'm glad we are all not social scientists. Because after some time, gradually you begin to lose your grip on reality. Once you go into the realm of your own imagination and all that. So the thing about science is that it teaches you not to be prejudiced, to be objective, not to be opinionated, to keep an open mind. Scientists are generally very quick to admit their mistakes. People who study other subjects are not able to admit their mistakes so easily. This is a cultural flaw we suffer in India. Indians hate to admit their mistakes because we feel it's a loss of faith. Even when we know we are wrong, we don't admit that we are wrong. This is a very debilitating feature of the Indian psyche. So if you study science, at least this is one thing that it will, if, and if you study science sincerely, it will <clears throat> allow you more easily to admit your mistake. So, when you are really wrong, you don't, you know, when I am right, I should, that's the other thing about science. When I am right, science teaches you to not yield. I sent a paper for refereeing. And the referee writes all kinds of rubbish. I know I am right. And if I am a good scientist, I will have the confidence to stand by what I have written. So you don't admit that you are wrong when you know you are right. Or at least when you feel you are right. At the same time when somebody proves to you properly that you are not correct, you admit it also. So these are all things, that, general things, good things that happen to you when you start studying science. For example, you lose superstition. You know, a lot of mumbo jumbo. And again, Indians are superstitious people. I am superstitious. We are all, we are all superstitious. We are much more superstitious than people in other cultures. But if you study science, somewhere some sense, good sense prevails. So that you don't start doing, you know, very crazy things. Little crazy allowed, very crazy not allowed. You know. So now what I want to do really is, principal said I should speak for about 45 minutes. I'll try to skip to 45 minutes but maybe 5 minutes more it will be something like that. Anyway now we don't have to worry about those stupid slides and you know saying next slide, next slide and all. So some time is saved in that so we'll can speak a little bit more. So what I thought I'll do is, I'll give you some little examples of scientists from the past who I have selected because they faced some unusual problem somewhere and which came in the way, they, they were th doing something in science and because of their science they faced some problems, something like that, roughly speaking. So these are not just any 10 people that I picked at random, I picked them with some purpose in mind. And uh, also to teach you about what made these people do science and what are the things we can learn from them. So the first fellow I am going to talk about is Galileo. Now we all know what he did. He went to the Tower of Pisa and threw that things and then both the heavy and the light landed at the same time. All those stories we know. Now Galileo was actually a very smart chap. He was just like some professor like all of us. And I am telling your teachers also that we should not think life of a professor is so great because it's not great. Most of the time you are asking somebody for money. Like the government. And the government doesn't have money to give you. 
So when you go on asking some something from somebody and he doesn't have it to give you, then that means you are a fool. After some time you should realize that he doesn't have the money, not that he doesn't want to give you, but he doesn't have it to give you. That's what's happening to science in India today. So be very careful before you start saying, I'll do MSc, I'll do PhD, I'll do postdoc, then I'll get a job, uh, then I'll get, no. That, that's when it will stop. Because then you will not get any money to do your work. So a lot is happening today in India. So Galileo also was a professor in small university called Padua in northern Italy. He wanted money. And uh, then he found there was some fellow in Holland who had taken two convex lenses and he was playing with the convex lenses. This is, this is quite nice for me. So, let me go some kitsch kitsch something. So, he wanted some money. He found this fellow two convicts that he was doing and suddenly things started appearing bigger. So, Galileo took this idea. Actually, he kind of stole the idea. And this is another thing about scientists. Sometimes, you know, mild stealing is allowed. Big, big stealing is not allowed, then it's called plagiarism and all that. So he got the idea from this Dutch lens maker. And then he put some value addition to that. He arranged those lenses in such a way, this Dutch fellow was getting an inverted image. Inverted magnified image he was getting, which you all know by looking at convex lenses, you have done those experiments. Okay, so then he put the two lenses, he got an image in the right hand side, still it's okay. It was still a scientific discovery. Now he wanted money, like we all want money from DST, DBT and all today and I told you they don't have money to give. So he went to the Duke of Venice. Venice was a big city close to Padua. Padua was one small, you know, place. Then Narendra Pur and then Calcutta and then Duke. So he went to Venice. And he went to the Duke of Venice and Venice was a key maritime hub and port in those days. The entry into Europe from Asia. And the Ottomans were always threatening Muslims to try to come in and attack Europe. Don't forget they had been kicked out of Spain recently and they were trying to come back like this way. And Venice was the place where they wanted to come because Venice was very rich. So then Galileo said, look Duke, I've got this stuff and I'm going to call it a telescope. He gave a name also, very important. He was a brand marketing man also, Galileo. Telescope name he gave. He said, you see this, if I put it in that, an object that is far away, I can see it as if it's very close, including objects I cannot see with the native eye, with the naked eye. So Duke became interested. He says, can you see a ship that is coming from far away? So Galileo said, sure, I can see. I'll show you also. So then suddenly Duke realized that this is a strategic thing that he needs. And suppose he knows that, that Ottoman ships are coming. Then he will be able to aim the gun and all that and, you know, pulverize those ships. So suddenly he showered Galileo with money. So, when you want money, you don't go to government and say, I am very poor, give me money, he will kick you out. You go to the defense ministry and say, I have done something which will help you to solve some strategic need. No research is done just like a vacuum in the blue sky. So, Galileo knew he needed money, His marketing thing he did. He got the money. And that was the first part of Galileo's story, which looks like a success story. Second part, he got into trouble. Because then, instead of looking at the sea, he put the telescope and started looking at the sky. When he started looking at the sky, he started seeing all sorts of things. We all know, all faces of the moon he saw. Then he saw that uh, the moons of Venus. And he started seeing Jupiter. And then the thing that got him into trouble was that he got saw a lot of stars in the sky. 
more stars that you can see with the naked eye because of the telescope. So he was so excited. This was all his fundamental research thing. So he started saying all these things. I saw these stars. That's when he got into trouble. He got into trouble with the church. Just now, principal has said that there is no essential conflict between science and religion. I just want to modify his statement. There is absolutely no conflict between science and religion. Only in Sanatan Dharma. In any Abrahamic religion. There is a direct conflict between science and religion because the religion depends on matters of faith, whereas science is based on evidence. Because our shastras tell us that if the evidence says something else, then the theory has to be changed. It says it very clearly in numerous places. In Sanatana Dharma. There is no conflict. Every other religion there is a conflict. Why was there a conflict of Galileo and the church? The Bible says that God made the stars to light the sky in the night so that people can see. So then the church asked him, then why did God put stars which you cannot see? Looks logical, no? From their point of view. So then they went to the next step. So you are going against God's works. You are telling us that there are some new things there which really, you know, God, we can't see those stars and then you are telling us those stars are there. So you are going against the Bible. So they said you come to Rome. There was also a political reason for that. It was not purely religious because in those days the Vatican was a big power broker of Europe. So it was trying to see how it can irritate people in the rest of Italy. So they caught him and then they tried him and all of us know that he was forced to say that all his discoveries were wrong and all that stuff. So sometimes why I am telling Galileo example is that you get into trouble with the government, then what is Galileo supposed to do? Is he supposed to go by his science or is he supposed to go by his religion? This is a moral dilemma he had. And scientists will face these kinds of moral dilemmas. And it is something that you should be prepared to accept when you are a scientist. So how do you keep yourself detached at the same time thing? Photo Galileo. Second man I want to mention is Lavoisier. Lavoisier is a name who is very well known to chemistry students. And he led a very interesting life. And there are many things about Lavoisier that we need to know and remember. Firstly, he was born in a middle class family. He was a good student and he studied. And a um, very important thing about Galileo was his marriage. He married a very rich woman who was also a very good scientist. Madame Lavoisier actually recently had been listed as one of the top 10 women scientists of the world in a survey that was done about 2-3 years ago. So she kept her scientific profile behind and helped Lavoisier in his scientific works. She used to write his notes down at the end of every day of experiments. And uh, she also knew English. Lavoisier did not know English, so she would transmit all his messages to the people in England and all that. And at the same time, she was also from a very wealthy family. So she gave Lavoisier social access into circles that he would never have been able to get otherwise. So the reason I mention this is Lavoisier, that I have seen more than one successful scientist 
who had a very understanding and cooperative spouse. Both male scientists and their cooperative wives and women scientists with cooperative husbands. I have seen both these situations very often in my own life. And therefore this is to underscore that for scientists doing science, even the extended domain in which you operate, your family, your immediate thing, surrounding, it's not just the lab and students and all that, but even the kind of cooperation and the kind of support and the kind of encouragement that you get from your spouse is very, very, very important. Don't underestimate that part. It's not that this work is that the science is something different, some family is something else is different. No, 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 nothing is different. All are the same. God only gave you one life to lead. And that life includes all these parts, holistic. Now, his famous scientific discovery, of course, is his discovery of oxygen. Remember at that time there was one crazy theory going around called phlogiston theory. I don't know how many of you in this room have heard this word phlogiston. Huh? No, nobody. This you should you have read, you know the phlogiston. Please go and read what is this phlogiston. It was a very crazy theory that went on for 100 years. And many notable scientists believed this phlogiston theory. People were studying burning, you know. So they said those substances that burn very easily have got a lot of something called phlogiston. And then when you burn something that phlogiston goes away. And then what is the evidence for that? They said take a piece of wood and burn it. Wood is you know, be nice and big. And you burn it and then finally you get a small amount of ash. So they said that the ash is that what is left which is much less than the wood. Because the phlogiston has gone away. There was no evidence for any of this, by the way. And then they said that when, the, when you burn something in air, what happens? What is left is nitrogen and carbon dioxide. So they said that from the air, phlogiston is taken away. And then therefore what is left is dephlogisticated or something like that. Now, Lavoisier contested all these things and through his lovely experiments involving taking a weighed amount of mercury and making it mercury oxide and then heating the mercury oxide and making it back into mercury. He showed that when substances burned, they actually gained weight, they didn't lose weight. Even when he was able to prove all these things, noted chemists like Priestley believed in the phlogiston theory. Will you believe it? I mean, this also tells you about human psychology. He is giving all these evidence. And at that time, famous Robert Boyle of Boyle's Law of Fame, he came and said, no, 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 this is alright, but uh, it means that phlogiston has negative weight. So they were actually prepared to invoke something with a negative weight in order to prove the theory. So this tells you another thing about science. The moment you put your theory, that means your ideas, all that social science type thing. If you put those theories above the data and the facts, then you have to start contradicting yourself. What Negative weight. Something has negative weight. Nothing has negative weight, you know. So finally, and because of this, you know, one can give a beautiful, you know, full one hour lecture on Lavoisier itself. He made oxygen as the most important element in the periodic table. Because this oxygen is something against which all the elements are calibrated. When you say a metal is reactive, a metal is non reactive, it measures. The reactivity of that element with oxygen. There is one more element which reacts with every other element that is fluorine. But fluorine is so rare and very difficult to obtain in the natural form so we don't think about it. And I have written somewhere, you know, if you look at the periodic table, in India we have got, no President of India, Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi. 
So we know what is the relative power. Who is more powerful? We know. So just like that, gold may be the president of India, but oxygen is the prime minister. That will tell you the importance of oxygen because oxygen likes some elements more, it likes some elements less, like prime minister. And whom the prime minister likes, whom the prime minister dislikes, makes a very important difference in their individual fates also. So, it is important hai oxygen. The whole periodic table, the whole chemistry. Oxygen is the ruler scale against which everything in chemistry is calibrated. If you ask me, it is the most important element, not just important for human life. That also may be because of this. That because everything is calibrated with respect to oxygen. So, the first person who first said oxygen is a separate element. In my mind is probably the greatest chemist who ever lived, that is the first. And then he got into subsequent trouble, of course. One of the fellows, this also we tell Professor Bandhogadeh about DSK, you know. There was one fellow who submitted a scheme to Lavoisier, research project about phlogiston and all that. And saying that I can prove that phlogiston exists and this, that, so many things he wrote. So Lavoisier took this project and threw it in the dustbin. He said it's garbage, garbage project. Which is what we all do. Sometimes when we see one project is very bad. So Mandubadeh knows all these things. And because it's happening all the time. This man's name was Mara, M-A-R-A-T. Pronounced in French Mara. He's a sort of a failed scientist. He became a politician. Not uncommon. When you fail in all other professions, you go to college. So he went to politics and he was one of the ringleaders of that French Revolution. And you know what that French Revolution was. In that famous Place de la Concorde in Paris, they put one big machine called the guillotine. So they would take all the people whom they don't like and then give them a trial of about five minutes and then take them to the guillotine and chop their heads off. So this Mara remembered with the voice here throwing his project out. So you see, in trying to do good science, the voice here actually lost his life. At the age of 50, just 50, he had done so many wonderful things. There was one trial, this Mara was the chief judge. So he says, uh, the Republic does not need scientists. That was the word. So France had, was changing over from a monarchy to a republic. So they said, Republic doesn't need scientists. So we'll chop his head off. Within 15 minutes, they took it and they chopped his head off. So he paid with his life I think. And when he died, there was another famous mathematician, French mathematician, called Lagrange, whom you might have heard in this famous word, Lagrange polynomials. Joseph Louis Lagrange. And he said, it took them an instant to chop off his head. It will be another hundred years before a similar person is produced in France. You know, so that was the high regard in which Lavoisier was held by all the people, the French scientists of the time. So you see, Lavoisier is a life of great ups and downs. And it tells you that, you know, science, in trying to do good science, he changed chemistry forever, which is why I am talking about him. You know, nearly 250 years after he died, with such great respect. But at the same time, he lost his life because in the Galileo case, the science came to conflict with religion. In the second case, science comes into conflict with politics. So, these are all the things that will happen to you sometime when you get into a life of science. If you want to do your science properly. Now let's move a little faster and uh, very briefly I'll take a chemist by the name of Richard Willstetter. Some of you might have heard his name, others might not have heard his name. He was a Nobel laureate, 1915 or 1916 I think. 
He was a synthetic chemist. A very famous synthetic chemist who used to be a full professor in the University of Munich in Germany. And his name is especially well known for the synthesis of alkaloids. Especially cocaine, tropine, all these fused heterocyclic alkaloids. So it's a classical name in actual products organic chemistry. Now, the measure of the intellectual prowess of Bill Stater, I have talked with many synthetic chemists over the years. And uh, usually when chemists start talking to each other, we start discussing obviously chemistry. Uh, which do you think is your favorite reaction across historical time? Many people mention Bill Stater's synthesis of propane. Now, what was so great about the synthesis? He published it in 1906. Now, all of you are what is it? BSc, MSc students. So, you all have chemistry, you all have studied, or you are studying. How many of you don't study chemistry here at all? Everybody has studied. So, good. Then you will understand the example that I will give. So, this is an exam question. How do you make para nitro how do you make para nitro anilin? Anybody can answer. You take anilin. You cannot nitrate it directly. Because if you nitrate, if you take anilin and put a nitrating agent in that, you will get a black mess. It, the anilin is so reactive towards electrophilic substitution that uh, it will just become tar. So you can't do that. So when you are asked to make para nitro anilin, you will say, ah. Huh, so I can't use nitrating mixture. So I'll take anilin, I'll put acetic anhydride, I'll make acetanilide, and that is called protecting the amino group. To protect that group and make a compound called acetanilide. Now this acetanilide you can treat it with nitrating mixture. And that acetanilide also, because of that NH group there, it becomes ortho para directing. The main product is para nitro acetanilide. You still don't have your final gold compound, that is para nitro acetanilide. So then that is the next step. I take para nitro acetanilide and then I hydrolyze it, which is a very simple reaction. Just boil it in some mildly acidic medium. It will knock off the acetyl group again and then I get my para nitro anilin. So, suppose I am saying, I am giving you the question. How do you make para nitro anilin from anilin? By your intuition and your knowledge, we will say first protection step, there is a nitrating step and there is a deprotecting step. This is something that you and I and anybody in this room will just be able to do automatically. Will get a synthesis of tropinone, which is the precursor to tropine and then cocaine, did not involve two steps. He started with a compound called suberone, which looks quite different from his gold compound. Suberone is a seven membered ring. Ketone. You can check it out in Google. S U B E R O N E. Suberone, he started. So then he started doing all sorts of reactions with it. One, two, three. Not just two reactions or something. Not three steps. Not four steps. Not five steps. Not six steps. Not seven steps. Not eight steps. Sixteen steps. He visualized in his head only. He looked at tropin structure, he knew what is superone, and he could visualize those 16 steps in his head. That is why so many synthetic chemists today, I have asked Casey Nikolaou, I have asked Stuart Schreiber, I have asked all these people, they come back to this Vilstator synthesis of propinone, 1906. They think, how can one man think of 16 steps like that? He must have been literally genius. I mean, we know these organic reactions. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. Crazy it is. 
he could visualize the whole thing and then he could do it also. Visualizing is one, doing is something quite different. So all these things he put together and made so his ability to foresee, foresee into the future. Foresee into those reactions is so great that you can't understand it today. I can't understand it. How somebody could have been, look at you. All these things are now downloadable. Just take Bill Stater synthesis of uh, Probinome. How somebody could have visualized all these steps and transformations, one after the other, one after the other, one after the other. So he was at the height of his intellectual powers. 1915, he got an Nobel Prize. 1923, when he was the top man in German chemistry, Munich University, he abruptly resigned his job. You may ask why? Why did he? Hey, by 1920, after First World War, I'll give you the hint, Will Stater was Jewish. I think now you are beginning to get the picture. So he started seeing things, not very big things, but just small things. One of the things apparently he saw, was he was coming to the lab in the morning and he saw some young boys kicking a dog. Small school kids. So he asked them, why are you kicking that dog? The, he, that uh, school boy told him, that's a Jewish dog, that's why I'm kicking it. He just saw some small things like this, 1923, without anybody telling him anything. He just resigned the job. All his students, postdocs, so many associates, they said, what are you doing? He said, no. What I see, I don't like. And this is not going to turn out well. 1923, even the beer hall books of Hitler had not yet happened. Hitler had not even written Mein Kampf by then. Before all these things, how did this man realize that in 10 years, till 1926 he was in Munich only and he used to direct some things in his lab on the telephone. He never went to the lab. Then in 26 he went away to Zurich. He said, I am going to leave Germany, a country that born, brought up everything. And some people have asked me, then I said, my answer, this is my answer. Somebody who could foresee 16 steps in the tropinon reaction, it was very easy for him to foresee the Holocaust. He did not need so much evidence, but he knew that that's the way it will go. So Winstinger's life tells you that this ability to predict, this ability to look into the future, which characterizes a good scientist. A good scientist does not copy he does not imitate. He always wants to do something new. A scientist can have many bad points. But if he doesn't know how to be novel, he is not a scientist. It has to be new. That is why the whole India is full of uh, professors, assistant professors, IIT, ICER, blah, blah, blah. They are only doing the research, postdoc research that they did in America, Germany, Japan. They come back and they repeat the same thing. That's all. Bogus. All bogus. When I look at an application in evaluation and all I see, I see all the papers that they wrote. I see the number of citations that these papers got. Three, four, five top cited papers are coming from PhD and postdoc work means junk. That means he or she is not able to think on their own. They are only doing that old copy. Copy paste. Hmm. So, this is the illustrator story. Now we will come a little bit later. I don't know how, how much time we have got. Another 15 minutes, uh, Maharaj? 15 minutes? Huh? 15 minutes. Ah. I, want, I want to talk to the student. Now the professors want to see me. So I'll, I'll, come I'll stand here for some time. Now look. Uh, whom shall we whom shall we we'll talk about next? Ah. Ah, we'll take this guy. Another German. 
Max von Lowe. Max von Lowe was a wonderful fellow. He was a physics man. And it was the height of intellectual activity in physics in Germany around 1900-1905, that, that period. Whole physics was undergoing a revolution with the quantum theory and all that. And uh, Lowe himself was a postdoc in the lab of a very famous physicist called Sommerfeld, Irwin Sommerfeld. Sommerfeld was an even more colorful character than Lowe. He is the guy who has got the record of the maximum number of nominations for a Nobel Prize. I think some 80 times he got nominated, but he never got the Nobel Prize. There are people who have been nominated just once and they have got it. So, it is a lottery. And some of a very colourful character. He belonged to an old aristocratic Prussian family. And when he was a youngster, he was just like a, you know, sporty type and all that. He got into a duel with swords and all. You know, Swami Vivekananda tells you always that mind and body have to be developed. Both have to be developed. It is not good just to, you know, study and get the good marks, but you must also develop. He says it, Vivekananda says it all the time. So, the Sommerfeld got into this thing and the other opponent gave him a huge slash on the face. So, he carried that slash toward his life. And he was a very big professor of physics and Lave was not very scared of him. Now, Lave had some crazy ideas. He was, his project was in optics and all it was about diffraction. And some people had told him that ever since Röntgen discovered X-rays, he had what he thought was a crazy idea. That is that the spacings in a crystal are roughly maybe about the wavelength of an X-ray. So, just like you can have optical diffraction, which was his specialty. His specialty was optical diffraction. His project was on optics. He said, would it be possible for a crystal to diffract an X-ray? I could say the rest is history, but the rest is not history. He went and he made a foolish mistake of telling his idea to Sommerfeld, who was himself a great physicist. And actually, although I am saying Lowe, this story is about both Lowe and Sommerfeld. So, Sommerfeld told him, I believe this is a rubbish idea. I am not paying you money to do all these things. You, know, you just stop all this kind of junk. You do what I have told you to do, you do that properly, that's enough. Don't waste my money in doing all this. So, Lave just kept quiet, he went his head down. I mean, if the professor is telling you something, then what can you do? You just have to put your head down. Then the summer when I told you this sword fencing and all that, he took a three day holiday from Munich and went somewhere, maybe to have some more of this fun with some of his friends. So suddenly this Lave got one dirty idea. He said, this man is gone for three days. So he called two assistants in the lab called Friedrich and Knipping. They are all the legendary names in crystallography today. So he called this Knipping and Friedrich and he said, where they go? <laughs> Their chance is there. They had some equipment cooked up and in those days some X-ray generator something is there. That whole ramshackle thing is there in the Deutsches Museum in Munich. So we, we all go there today and just to look at it. And then, then they took the only crystal they had immediately. They, somebody remembered copper sulfate. They had something in the lab which was on big blue crystal. So they just pushed it in the X-ray beam. They put one film and then really the rest is history because he saw those five dots. And. Uh, Then some of it came back. He had to tell him that I have done the experiment and the result came like this. And you won't believe it. That is, you won't believe the result. He told him this, some of it immediately got up and he said, This is wonderful, this is great. Immediately I am going to communicate this result to the Bavarian Academy of Sciences. This should be published immediately because he said, This discovery is something that is truly outstanding. 
So you see, when I said that scientists do not hesitate to admit when they are wrong, so Amma felt the great scientist that he was. Immediately he knew that he was wrong and now he was right. This also shows that the younger, older, and all doesn't matter in science. Of course, rest goes on and on. It can, you know, really go on for a long time. And then Lavoisier thing led to Bragg and you know structure of sodium chloride, so many things, and etc. etc. DNA, DNA again came as a result of a diffraction experiment. But if you want to know where this whole structural idea of using X-ray now, it started with Lavoisier. And he started with homophed, and he started with homophed solid, without which we wouldn't have got this result at all. We would have got it, but it would have happened in some other way. So it tells you that you know various scientists of various types have faced various problems. Then you may still ask yourself a question. So Professor Desiraju has talked about so many people. Uh, why is he not talking about anybody in India? Is it that we never had anyone? No, we did, and in fact, I am going to talk about two people who were very important for science in India, and wonderfully, good coincidence, they operated in a place not very far from me. The first that I will mention, obviously, is Mahindra Lal Sarkar, and uh, we all know that he is a wonderful career. You know, he's a chap who is some eighteen-year-old boy or something. He was, uh, I think, a junior student or something in a medical college in Calcutta. And the British professor was asking some question to the students, medical students, and nobody could answer. And this young boy outside, he shouted the answer, which was the correct answer. And uh, so the professor said, "Who is that chap?" Who is and they said something. He is just a young student, or he is not even a student. Something like that. So then he became one of the foremost practitioners of allopathic medicine in Calcutta at that time, around 1870 something, 75 something that period. And then suddenly, once again, just like scientists are not scared to change, you know. Fear, fear does not a, a, a emotion that comes easily to a good scientist. So, if you are a fearful person, then think twice before you get into science. Fear is something that uh, is, doesn't go with science. He, you know, made a what physicists call first order phase transition, and he got into homeopathy. And in fact, he is one of the doctors who treated. Sri Ram Krishna. He was his homeopathic doctor, and in those days, his homeopathy thing was very important in Calcutta and the same. And even that was not enough for him. Please, if you look at the history of India, history of Bengal, around the period, you know, eighteen ninety, the era, India was at her lowest. Yeah. I call it twelve hundred years of sadness. Was hanging over the country like the dark monsoon clouds today that you see like that. Well, and it is a dirty history was hanging on us. We were at our lowest. The British had completely castrated us mentally so that we lost all sense of self worth. An inferiority complex that continues even till today, seventy-five years after it. The moment we see a white face, we start getting excited. You people are all young. You don't have this baggage. Please don't get into that. What Sai Deepak calls colonial. Don't get into that. It's not required. They're stupid people. The same Germany of Wilstetter and Lawe. I was telling principal and other last week they have passed a law. I can't recognize that this is the Germany of Wilstetter and Lawe. They passed the law that officially any citizen of Germany can change their first name and change their gender once a year. So I am a man. I can go officially and make myself into a woman. After one year, I can change back to a man. 
That is the Germany of today. You want to go and uh, work over there in that country? What kind of country is that? What kind of country is America? Yesterday I told you, Vidya Madhya, all of us know about Swamiji's lecture in Chicago. He went to Chicago. After giving the lecture, he never said, hey, give me a green card. He never said that. He roamed around for six years in foreign countries. He came back. Karma Bhumi, Punya Bhumi, Pitra Bhumi, this Bhumi. He came back only to this Bhumi. People are all young, you are lucky. You have not experienced life in the post independence trauma of that British coloniality and all. The bricks mean nothing to you. In Calcutta, at least, you see some of their names. Some canning, the lousy, something you see. But in the rest of India, we don't even see those names. They are just some stupid cold country in the North Atlantic, that's all. They are nothing. So don't make them into something which they are not in. We are better than them. Before I tell everybody, in about 10-15 years, there will only be three countries in the world. USA, China, India. All the other countries will not come. You are lucky enough to be born in one of these three countries. And today, don't go and make a stupid mistake of going and saying, I want green card in America. That's not what you came to Vidya Mandira for. Or to Narendra Pur for. You have come to the place of Vivekananda. This should mean something to you afterwards. This, is, this place is not a place where you will have come just to get good marks so that I can go and do PhD in IISC so that then I can go and do postdoc in Taiwan or something. Ah, Taiwan. Today the Chinese are PLA encircling Taiwan completely. What happens to all our great fellows who say Taiwan, Taiwan, Taiwan? So many people are running to Taiwan. Kyae Taiwan? Not even a country. Already I ruled out all the countries except three and I said that one of my very dear and close Italian colleagues has told me, he said, Gautam, after some time Italy will be like Disneyland. Only rich Indians and Chinese will come there to you know, see all our sites. So don't, don't make more of these foreign countries. See, this is a time of India has come now and see, Sarkar means he could foresee all this. Within 15 years, Raman came and he discovered that. The only true indigenous discovery. One of the few Indians who did work in India and got a Nobel Prize for it. All the others, either they did the Indians who did work outside. You know. Some fellow who worked on economic, somebody from Calcutta. Huh? Amartya Sen, yeah, he worked in Delhi, but he did all his work abroad. His other fellow who got class. Huh? Banerjee something. What do you know? Abhishek. Abhijit Banerjee. Some Abhijit Banerjee. You know, Indian got it over there. Oh, he went to JNU, he prepared some paratha over there. All this junk. Junk. They are all brown Americans. They are not Indians. Indian hai, Indian lab mein kaam kiya hai. Because of that kaam done in Indian lab, did he get Nobel Prize? Yes or no? No means no. Some Korana. No. None of those people. Only Raman. Only C.V. Raman. Sandra Shankara Venkata Raman who came and did the work in cultivation. This lab set up by Mahendra Lal Sarkar. Remember all these names. At a time when India was psychologically lowest, one minute. I will ask you, I'm finishing. I'm reaching the end. Oh, no. After Raman, I can't say anything else. So, I'm not saying these, these people are not gods. Gidilio is not a god, uh, Lamboise is not a god, Raman is not a god. They are all ordinary people who faced problems. Big problem. 
because of their science. Raman wept when he went to get the Nobel Prize because he saw that Union Jack flag flying over there. The fact that I am not able to pick up a prize under the flag of my own country, I have a country of his own. So that is the story. So when I say science, I don't know what you are expecting, whether you thought I am going to give you some learned uh, talk about this and that. But this is what it is and as I said, scientists should not be scared and absolutely the very last thing I want to say, something which is of course interesting and very close to me, scientists I told you should not be scared. I think already you know my general attitude toward the social sciences. I've got a lot of good friends in that, those departments. Don't forget, I was in the University of Hyderabad for 30 years before I went to IIS. So, in a university, like you have a lot of fun. Social scientists, this, that, they'll be there talking, drinking coffee, and all that. Which we scientists we don't like to do so much. Some Ganga Dhaba, something. Different, different type. They're different types from us. Not the same. So, during the COVID time, I was, you know, just locked up in the house like everybody else. So I started reading. I couldn't go to my lab. I sent away all my postdocs to their native place and so obviously I was quiet. So I don't want to waste my time. So I started reading. So I was actually thinking about our own country and the fact that most of my life I've spent in India. I spent three and a half years getting my PhD in University of Illinois. Two years I worked in Eastman Kodak Company. Sirf Sade Panch Saal, I have spent outside India. Rest of my life, I have spent only in India. So, I have seen this whole tamasha and drama of India in the last 75 years. I am now going to be 70 in a few weeks from now. So, I have seen quite a bit of this show. You know, what's going on. So, I started wondering, why is everything so horrible? Why is it that nothing seems to be okay? And I am not talking about... Uh, Political party or political affiliation, this, that, no. Because I view myself as a reasonably, that way I am not politically greatly enamored by any party. I will go and vote like everybody else. But like that we are all doing. We don't have to be necessarily into some political thing. Just like that. No. So, as I, if it doesn't matter who is in power, but still nothing seems to be working. And I see so many students. I have seen so many students. There's nothing wrong with our brain power, nothing wrong with our national uh, natural resources, nothing wrong with so many things. So then I am using the principles of a scientist. If so many things are wrong, then they all must have some common cause. It is not that this thing is wrong or that person was the wrong prime minister or this thing. No, not like that. But there will be something more fundamental. So this took me back to the constitution. So what I then, I started reading the constitution in great detail. Covid was a long period of time. I am used to reading. So, so this is part of my training. So I started reading and after some time I decided I better start writing. Then I found out that the constitution itself has got some very very basic defects. Which the writers of the constitution knew very well. They were all very very patriotic people. Didn't matter what political party they that's a beautiful thing, not like today's politics. They knew that there are some mistakes. There is a mistake there about center state relations. There is a mistake there about Hindu Muslim. There is a mistake there about caste. They knew all these mistakes are there. And at the same time, they put some ad hoc solution called it constitution. So I started writing about this book. And I, dear students, I want to tell you on 15th of August, it will be Pre-order is coming. The book is called Bharat India 2.0. And it's about the constitution. What's wrong with the constitution? What is a civilizational state? Why India is a civilizational state and not a nation state? We are very different from most countries in the world. Because we are a civilizational state. The only other big one which is a civilizational state is China. So, we have two big civilizational states in the world today who are going to be at loggerheads in the future. So, what is the thing? What is the solution? Solution I won't tell. Like, 
Scientists like to give solutions. Social scientists are happy with just stating the problem. This is the main difference I have found between scientists and social scientists. Because scientists work with data. Social scientists work with their emotions. I don't know what they call it. Something they call it. Some gula bag. I don't have a very high opinion of it. As you can see. And I also wanted to show that a scientist principle said a scientist can become a monk. A scientist can write about the constitution. Because I'm a scientist, in the beginning they said, oh, you are a scientist. Oh, how do I write? Am I not a citizen of this country? Don't I have a stake? Am I not a stakeholder? Is it not my constitution? Although it's your constitution. It's everybody's constitution. If I can't write about something that is mine, then what are you talking? Only you are allowed? Only Rajdeep Sardesa is allowed to tell us about the constitution? I mean, what is going on? Really, I have written all these things in the book. Solution I won't tell you, read the solution. And uh, pre-order will come on 15th. The book will be in bookstores on 8th September. Bharat India 2.0 I have written three books in scientific topics. This is my first book on a non-scientific topic. On this note, I will end. And I think Professor Bandhavadi is a little fidgety. So, he is my dear friend, through whom I was able to... He is very dear to the RKM. And uh, he is part of the RKM family. So he is not just any old scientist. So, through his... Good graces, I have come here, I have had a chance to talk to all of you. I am actually very glad that, you know, I was telling principal also, and these people who know me well, know me well, that when I see the hall and I see the student, then I decide what I am going to speak. And as I came into the hall, I said the shape and dimensions of the hall and that screen so far away. So I threw away the speech that I had prepared. And they said, I am going to talk something else which is more suiting this hall and the students and all of you. And the principal was kind enough to give me this microphone without which I would be sitting there in Bangalore and talking to you. That would have been online talk. Now I am doing real offline talk, physical talk with all of you. I am really enjoying these physical talks again. The whole life I have given physical talks and then suddenly to sit in online and talk in front of a laptop that makes me mad. So anyway, that's it. Chairman, I give you the mic and I've gone on long and long. Inspiring talk and analysis. Now I request Officer Udai Bandhavadai to address our students. Uh, I don't like to occupy your grey matter anymore. Because you, know, you have already been saturated and there is no scope to accommodate me right now. I first thank uh, Dr. Desi Raju for his wonderful scintillating lecture with originality, with bold statement. You know, in essence, it's a primary duty for me as entrusted by Maharaj that in essence, I'll try to give you an abstract of his lecture. He would like to emphasize that the true nature of science and its critical role to give your mind a safe and dimension. And with that, you will act upon to teach your ear and eye so that you will have a beautiful, rational reason to look around you. And you don't like to pay your ear to anyone. That rational mind will guide you what you will listen, what you will not listen, what you will reject, what you will accept. 
So this mind will help you. And the second thing, what is thinking? Please give up a national feeling that why you are doing science? Why you are being called educated guy? What is the signature that we have a rational mind? So this will help with your support in New India. We should not try to be a legendary slave years and years and years. That was the second emphasis. Third, I like to tell you that I like to quote science of three legendary persons. Whatever you may say. So, in essence, I can tell you that a great philosopher told milk is white and nutritious because I would like to define who is beginning. And the definition that attracted me a lot, very nice, that is, he uttered, milk is white and nutritious. Who knows? He is gany. Who does not? He is organic. But who consumes milk and became healthy, he is gany. Quoted by Ramakrishna. I like to quote that the confusion between science and technology. Just like different religions, they are fighting each other. Still in India, science and technology, they are fighting with each other, formulating and doing something and not knowing, consuming nothing. So, Nibhidita quoted that science is root of the same plant where branches are technologies. So, science will imbibe nutrition to keep the plant growing so that the flowers and fruits of technologies will emerge. So there is no conflict between it. In essence, Professor Deshiraj would like to tell all these things in a very nice mode. The third aspect I like to quote Swami Vivekananda. He categorically means, and how you will say that you are a knowledgeable guy, you are a scientifically tempered person. He told you must have three steps. Knowledge follows three successive steps. First, emotional appreciation. Whatever the things you would like to understand DNA, you like to make a crystal, you like to make an anti-covid vaccine, you like to understand the ozone layer, you would like to find out new stuff, whatever the things, you must have an emotion. Swamiji told, the first step of knowledge is emotional appreciation of the knowledge to be received. But he told, never stop there. The second step will be intellectual absorption of the emotionally appreciated matters. That means in emotion, there are lots of irrational things. Science will help that guy to eradicate irrational part so that he will be irrational in nature. So you have to absorb intellectually the emotionally conceived matter. Then he again told, stop not. Not you are not a knowledgeable guy. The third step is that try to spiritually assimilate the intellectually absorb emotionally conceived matter. Ultimately, Venus Paul used to tell, have you taken vitamin C? Oh. Please you take vitamin C. Same thing spiritual scientists teach you in the that don't have to go for meditation. Just have a drum, you should play the name of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. That's the philosophy of Chaitanya. That doesn't mean he was a very null dull guy. So in science is same. So same thing is that. So emotional appreciation, intellectual absorption and spiritual assimilation. And all these things will make you rationally scientific tempered persons. These are the things I would like to submit you. And again, I am really thanking uh, Maharaj, uh, Bhagavad Maharaj for giving us the scope to talk about it. And really, really nice, nice things because you are all are worshipping knowledge and you all are worshipping to be a scientifically tempered person. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Bandhavadra. Now I request Gombachari Sudhi Chaitanya for concluding remarks. He is vice principal of work for Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Ramakrishna. It's my honor to propose the formal word of thanks. I should say that we are all very fortunate to have had, to have had amidst us not just one scientist but two eminent scientists with us and where we could hear them in what they had to say about science in general. At the outset, on behalf of Ramakrishna Mission Residential College, we would like to extend our heartfelt thanks, gratitude and appreciation 
to Professor Desi Raju, who is an honorary professor from the Helling from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, for his interesting, engaging, and thought-provoking talk. As uh, Sir also mentioned, uh, Professor Banerjee, it was a original uh, thought that he shared with us through his different uh, anecdotes of great genius scientists. He drew few important points which we need to remember as students of science. I just want to summarize uh, summarize and just list out those points. I may have missed a few things, but he insisted on having a data-driven approach, open to admit mistakes, unbiased approach, be fearless and be noble. The novelty is lacking. So all these things he indirectly conveyed to us through his different anecdotes. So that was all in all an interesting talk for us. So on behalf of the college, we thank you once again, sir, for your wonderful lecture. And we would also like to extend our heartfelt thanks to Professor Banerjee, Director, Bose Institute, Kolkata, for summarizing what uh, Professor Desiraju mentioned. So succinctly giving examples from uh, Thakur, then Sister Nivedita, Nivedita and Swamiji. And we would also like to thank uh, uh, Rathindranath Ghosh, Professor Rathindranath Ghosh, for emphasizing the importance of science. And seminars such as this will help us to enhance our science and also to develop that scientific outlook in you all. So you may have liked this subject, science and have taken, but now there are certain things which you need to follow in order to be a good scientist or a good science student. So that, as Professor has already mentioned it to you. And our programs to Rivet Principal Maharaj for uh, welcoming the gathering here. And uh, our special thanks to Professor Prashanta Ghosh for anchoring the event so gracefully. And uh, our namaskars to uh, Brahmachari Kedara Chaitanya for being with us here and also helping us with the recording that is happening now. And special thanks to the faculty members and staff who have graced this occasion, who have patiently listened to his talk. And finally, to all the audiovisual volunteers, pe people who took some pictures, and also the chanting team. Finally, a big thanks to all of you for patiently listening to the talk, and hope this will uh, create certain stir within you and make you a good science student. Thank you, one and all. That is the end of the program. Now I request students to be there. First, our guest will come out. Then, okay.